Kia ora Gateway and welcome to Church Online. Some of you may still be away on holiday enjoying what's an incredible summer so far, soaking up all of this great weather, so thank you so much for joining us this morning. We will have some important information about our various activities here at Gateway to share with you over the next couple of weeks, so keep an eye on our usual channels for updates. Meanwhile, just a reminder that our 3pm open gathering, please make sure that you register through our website as we have a cap on numbers. In other news, we are hiring. We need a youth pastor to lead our CRAVE program, which is our high school aged young people. If you have a passion for young people, to see them become resilient disciples of Jesus and help to create a fun environment for them to thrive in, then we would love to hear from you. If you'd like to know more information about this role, how to apply, then please email mike at gatewaychurch.org.nz. So that's it from me. Again, it's great to have you joining us this morning. Let's hear from the Word of God. Welcome and thank you for joining us online today. It is so good that you could find time to, to be with us. It is a real delight to be able to share with you this morning. It was once said, there is more than enough struggle and discouragement and attack outside the walls of a church without us adding to it inside. There are times as Christians that I, that we have to make a decision that I will not be dragged down by something that is happening in my life or in the life of someone else that I love. Instead, I have to make a choice to strengthen myself in the Lord, that I will seek him, I will spend time with him. I will implement routines and practices to allow him to develop this way of responding and thinking and allowing this reality to take root in my life. The enemy of our soul is quite open, wants to destroy our life, to destroy our hope, obliterate our confidence, and wants to make us feel that nothing can ever change, that this is our lot. Therefore, there are times as Christians that we have to work out how we are going to confront him in his attempts to destroy our faith. This year in our summer series, we are taking as our theme, strengthening ourselves in the Lord and how we go about doing this to defend and to build ourselves up. Last week, we started at looking at King David when he was in Adullam's cave. And can I just encourage you to check it out online or at our webpage. Today, I want us to take time to think about a very simple idea, and it is the power of a thankful heart. And its inclusion in this series flows out of three things in my own thinking. <clears throat> First of all, the sheer volume of teaching on this subject in Scripture warrants its inclusion, the effect that thankfulness has. Secondly, I believe with all my heart that a truly thankful and grateful Christian is different to one who isn't. I know that's a bold statement, but I actually think it's true. Ask the question, would you prefer to spend time with a thankful person or someone who is never thankful or really thankful? Research actually shows that there are many benefits to being thankful and one of them is that if you're thankful you actually have a bigger community have more friends and thirdly last year at a couple of the weddings I took I chose to speak on the power of the bride and groom in their married life of learning and remembering to say thank you both then and in later years you'd think that this would be a given but the feedback was unprecedentedly positive from folks at the wedding. It actually took me surprised, if I'm honest. It, it amazed me. In subsequent weeks, couples came to me to say thank you for what I'd shared, and it, they said that it had changed their marriage for good. I make a suggestion. We've heard it say that if a person is rude to the waiter, then they're not perhaps a nice person. Perhaps we should consider thinking that the person who can't say or hasn't learned to say thank you for all things, and especially in marriage, is somewhat bent out of shape. Thankfulness can and will transform our lives. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Thankfulness is a repetitive theme throughout the Bible and it is mentioned virtually more than anything else. This call to be a thankful and grateful people. It is a habit, I fear, and just very personally, that in, some, in society 
we have lost something of the kindness and the graciousness of saying thank you, that perhaps we've gotten out of the habit of doing it. And, and maybe it's just my age, but it seems to, that we were more thankful or more appreciative in a years gone by. We can be thankful for myriads of things today. What are you thankful for God for today? This theme of thankfulness is repeated so often in the Bible that it's hard to know where to begin and hard to know what actually to, to leave out. But I have chosen three examples from the writings of Paul. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Then he goes on to say, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among you, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks to the God, the Father, at all times for everything in the name of Jesus Christ. That's from Ephesians chapter 5. And then Colossians 3 says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or do, deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It is an amazing truth that throughout Paul's letters, he encourages Christians to be thankful time and time again. And so it is throughout the whole of the word. It seems as if there is something about being thankful that unlocks our heart in a way that nothing else does. One of the aspects that I, I love about worship is being surrounded by people who are worshipping and giving thanks to God. It's as if I'm ushered into a new sp space and I can join them as we gather, as it were, together and around the throne, just giving God our thanks and our praise. But the wonderful thing is that as we engage and as we give thanks, he comes and he changes us and he does that work of transformation, of process, of cleansing our souls. There are four simple truths that I would like to share with us today that I believe that if we can acknowledge, appreciate, even embrace, they will help, in us, help us strength, be strengthened and encouraged. First of all, thankfulness flows from the awareness of God's promise. Thankfulness flows from the awareness of God's promise. Our starting point has to be with the acknowledgement that being thankful and being happy are not the same thing. It is possible to be thankful while finding at the same time our life to be incredibly difficult. It is possible to adopt an attitude of thankfulness that doesn't mean that we walk around with a grin on our face or being some in some constantly happy space. We can be thankful whilst at the same time as it feels we're going through hell. Thankful at the same time as facing huge challenges. Thankfulness is not an emotion. It is a decision of the will and the heart, and it is an act of intention. Throughout the Bible, this is what is seen as. The key to thankfulness is not getting more stuff. It is becoming more aware of the presence of God in our lives. An author called Robert Roberts has written a lot about thankfulness, and he says that there is a Christian framework for thankfulness, which is quite different from anything else. He says that thankfulness is a, in a Christian grows and develops when we make the intentional choice to be aware of the good, to look for the good in the worst situation and to give thanks to God for it. No matter what we are facing, find something to be thankful to God for and I believe it will unlock something in our heart. <laughs> Some of you may have heard me say this story before but please forgive me but it fits so appropriately today. There's a seminal moment in my life when I was a young teacher, a young schoolboy. I was out with my dad, but in order to understand this story, you'll need to know that when I was a teenager um, and growing up in South Wales, coal mining was a huge, dangerous and challenging industry in South Wales. It was only for the tough and the rugged. 
And my dad and I were out in the fields and it was uh, in the middle of winter and we were doing some work on some fencing and we were putting some fencing up for the, for the sheep or something. I don't really remember, but I do remember it was cold. And I do remember, and this must have been in the early 70s, we didn't have the machinery uh, that was, uh, that's available today for fencing. So some old fashioned sledge work and some old fashioned pulling and doing like, like that. And I remember saying something to my dad and perhaps in my own defense, I'm gonna say that I wasn't complaining, but I'd admit that perhaps I was whining about how cold it was and the situation we found ourselves in. And my dad stopped and he said something to me that changed my life and the way that I think. My dad said, Chris, the worst day in the open air is better than the best day in the coal mines. Radically changed my approach. It might be hard, it might be difficult, but the more we practice thankfulness, the more proficient we will become at it. Thankfulness flows from the way we look at the world, from where we understand God is. What I'm trying to say here about thankfulness flows from an awareness of God's presence and it can be summed up in this little Latin word, word called bene. The word bene in Latin means good. And it can be seen for our purposes in three ways under this th the issue of God's presence. Three ideas that flow out of goodness. First of all, benefits. If we are to be thankful, we have to learn to receive the gifts that God has for us. <coughs> the benefits that are in our salvation that God has to offer to us, his sons and daughters. We receive gifts from God all the time. The problem usually is that we most often miss them. If we miss the gifts or take them for granted, we miss the opportunity to be thankful. And this is extremely sad. Psalm 103 verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul and do not forget all his benefits. What are the benefits that God has given us? And there are lots of them in this very Psalm itself, which we don't have the time to read today. But in the first six verses, we read of the benefits of God as seen in his forgiveness, his healing, the benefit of his redemption, the benefit of his unending love and unfailing mercy, the benefits of the good things in our lives. And he gives us renewed strength. The first thing to understand about and be aware of God's presence is to receive his presence as a gift to us. God is not somewhere else right now. As we are doing this and as we are watching this, God is not somewhere else. And tomorrow, when we get up in the morning to face the same old boss who is driving us crazy, or maybe you were driving him crazy, God is there. If we allow it to be true in our heads and in our hearts, we will discover the reality that God will go with us to work. He will be waiting for us at our desk, in our schoolroom, in our office, in our ward and, the works, and our work site. We have the promise. We have the benefits of God's grace and mercy with us all the time. Just sometimes we need to have a, a shock to a system, I think, to remind ourselves. You see... Paul wrote that the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the benefit of God is eternal life. The gift that outstrips every other gift, the one we can't even begin to understand, that, that God has forgiven us and brought us into his family. Secondly, in regards to being aware of God's presence and to allow it to flow in us, we need only, not only to know about the benefits we need to be aware that they come from a benefactor. A benefactor is simply someone who does good. We can sometimes fall into the trap of forgetting that the goodness we receive does not come to us by accident. It is not one of those things that has just happened. It is not good fortune, if I can use that phrase. Whatever we find ourselves in today and the blessings that we have, it is a gift given by a person. And almighty God himself is the giver of these gifts. You see, the gift of life, the gift of strength, and all that we need to live for today comes from him. We need to avoid the subtle danger that allows us to think or lulls us into thinking that all we have, all that we've acquired, and all that we've secured in life 
comes from our own hard work, comes from our own hand, comes from our own cleverness, and originates in us. This is so incredibly dangerous. Never say this perhaps, but maybe that's how we think about life. James 1, 17 from the message says, Every desirable, desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts of rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. He brought us to life using the true word, showing us off as the crown of all his creatures. Everything that we have is from above. You know, wrapping this subsection up, not only are there benefits and a benefactor, but we are the beneficiaries. We are the ones who have received God's goodness and therefore we should be incredibly thankful. Something in our heart should erupt with praise because of all that God has done for us. You may simply think that you're sitting there doing whatever you're doing, but it's an illusion of miraculous proportion. Planet Earth is spinning around on its axis at about a thousand miles an hour. Every 24 hours, Earth fulfills a complete rotation. We are hurtling through space at an average velocity of over 67,000 miles per hour. This is not only faster than a speeding bullet, it is 80 time, 87 times faster than the speed of sound. So even on a day when we didn't get much done, we need to remind ourselves that we have just traveled 1.6 million miles or 2.5 million kilometers. Added to this, the Milky Way is spinning at the dizzy speed of 483,000 miles an hour. And if this is not miraculous, then I don't know what is. The USA news channel Fox, when commenting on these facts, said, you aren't just surrounded by miracles, you are one. When was the last time we thanked God for keeping us in orbit? I have to confess that I have never prayed. Lord, I didn't think that we'd make a full rotation today, but we did. We just don't pray like that. We just don't think like this. And here, please, I'm not trying to be funny or trite, but trying to make a very important part. We have already believed God for the big miracles, the miracle of being alive, of being held on this planet, of being able to know him and to know each other. We know the miracle of the whole creation. Yet the trick, if I can use the word, is learning to trust him for the little miracles. God is so good. He is so generous and he is so kind to us. Secondly, if thankfulness flows from the awareness of God's presence, thankfulness grows through humility. Thankfulness and humbleness, humility, all need to go hand in hand. We are never thankful for anything we think we are entitled to. We are never thankful for anything we think we're entitled to. Entitlement and thankfulness cannot exist at the same time in our own hearts. Here is the reality. The bigger sense of our entitlement, the smaller is our ability to be thankful. I am entitled to a good job. No, you're not. I'm entitled to a certain income and financial freedom. No, you're not. I'm entitled to a certain type of lifestyle. No, we're not. I'm entitled to a certain way of living because I am a Christian. No, we're not. I remember as a child uh, that we used to, every uh, autumn, always used to have a harvest Thanksgiving service, a very rural area, and all the people used to bring the produce, and there's always a great, great hymn that we used to sing, and it goes something like that. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. So thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord. All of these gifts are from him. And if we have a high level of entitlement, then we will have a low level of thankfulness. However, if we have a high level of humility, we will also develop a higher level of thankfulness. Because when we begin to understand just how many things God has given us, and the fact that we don't deserve them, it releases something in our hearts. The thrill and the privilege of living where we do. Lack of thankfulness or being ungrateful is not just a mindset that we need to change as Christians. It is a sin that we need to avoid. 
Paul writing to the church in Rome in chapter 1 says, for, th for though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. The further away we are from God, the harder it is to be thankful because somehow we think we are in control and we deserve better. See, the Bible often uses the word grumbling or complaining when it talks about a lack of thankfulness. Grumbling, sniping, complaining, bitterness, and so on. This type of person draws this type of person to themselves. And the heartbreaking, heartbreaking truth about these things is that when you are that type of person, eventually your joy goes and you wonder why. Where did my joy go? I believe it's absolutely correlated to our issue of thankfulness. You see, one's lack of thankfulness steals our joy. Our sense of always having to be right. Our sense of always having to be at the center. The one who always wants to get everything our way. This leads us to always end up being miserable. You see, this is what Satan does. He promises us power, autonomy, and freedom. But we don't realize that as we seek power, freedom, autonomy, that at the same time, he is putting shackles around our feet and he drags us down. I meet a lot of people who deep down feel they are entitled to something better, a better life, and they lament. Life's not fair. But life is not fair. But we are safe in his hands. But as we learn an attitude of humility that says God is gracious and kind, and every gift that he gives is good. Something changes in here. Something changes in our heart. Paul writes to the church in Corinth to challenge the way that they think. Their joy had been destroyed by their grumblings and their lack of thankfulness. And he's comparing them with the children of Israel. And he says, do not, and do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Satan will promise much and rip it away from us in order to leave us powerless and unthankful. In a book called Hannah Coulter, written by Wendell Berry, it tells the story of the life of a simple but wise Kentucky farmer's wife and mother. She and her husband Nathan are talking about what it will be like when the children grow up and go away. And this is what she thinks out loud. She says, the chance you had in life is the life you have got. You can make complaints about what people, including you, make of your lives after they have got them and about what people make of other people's lives, even about your own children being gone. But you mustn't wish for another life. You mustn't want to be someone else. What you must do is this. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. And then she adds this, I am not all the way capable of so much of this, but I know that these are the right instructions. I wonder today how many of us want another life. If I can be so bold to say, man, I'd like another wife or a different family or a different husband. Those are dangerous, dangerous words and we're on dangerous, dangerous ground. We will never be content and thankful until we embrace the one we have. If we can't be thankful where we are, we won't be thankful anywhere else because this is the way that it works. And that old adage, we always take ourselves with us wherever we go. Thirdly, thankfulness shows in blessing. Firstly, I want to explain what I mean. <clears throat> what I mean by the phrase of praying thankfulness in blessing is not praying blessing into our lives or into being, but in the midst of blessing, living a life of thankfulness for all things, praying in the midst of blessing, as it were. Jesus lived a life of gratitude and a life of thankfulness in all things. We can learn some important lessons here from him. You see, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a devout Jew. He would have prayed two prayers daily. This is, would have been his normal routine. The first prayer is what is called the Shema, and it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, Word, words that are familiar to us all. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. The second prayer every devout Jew was taught to pray, and still is, is called the 18. Sometimes it is called the benedictions because of how it works. A benediction in Hebrew is any work that begins with the word bless. So morning and evening, devout Jews will pray, blessed are you, Lord. First thing in the morning and the last thing at night. Blessed are you, O Lord. In the middle of the day, they would say and still do say, blessed are you, Lord, who abundantly forgives. They begin with thankfulness and end with thankfulness and would be thankful in the middle of the day. This would have been Jesus' norm. But you see, the rabbis loved this prayer so much that they taught their followers to use it as much as they liked and as often as they could. So they would add whatever ending they desired throughout the whole of the day. Blessed are you, Lord, who heals, who provides, protects, walks with me, has given me a home to live in. Blessed are you, O Lord, who has placed me in a family, who has heard my cry, who has provided for me, for your word, for the sun and the rain, and for my coffee, for when my sports team wins. You see, it is also known as the Amida prayer, prayer or the standing prayer. The, the rabbis thought that this was so serious and so important that they didn't want to get people relaxed or take it for granted so they had to stand when these prayers were made there is an urgency here there's another aspect of the whole idea that will help us i believe it is called the talamidium and it was when the disciple of a rabbi who would say to the rabbi and here is the formal phrase rabbi teach us to pray rabbi teach us to pray now i know that sounds familiar to us today because of scripture, what the disciples said, absolutely. And the rabbi would respond with a prayer of benediction. They would teach them how to pray in blessing. It can be argued that a more accurate way of beginning the Lord's prayer should be, blessed are you, O Lord, our, heaven, our Father in heaven, perhaps rather than our Father or hallowed be your name. Jesus was teaching them to pray blessings, thankful prayers, which were in line with how he had been raised and taught to pray with thankfulness. He was giving them a model to pray with thankfulness in their heart and at all points of life. Blessed be your name. The place of the Lord's prayer and giving thanks in the early church was pregnant throughout that time. This is why the blessing came for eat, when we came to eat. They didn't bless the food they thanked God for the blessing of food. This is why we say grace. It is an opportunity to say, Blessed be your name, O Lord, for the food I am about to eat. Blessed be your name, O Lord, for there are millions going hungry today, but you have given me this. It trains thankfulness into our hearts and thanking God for everything was incredibly important to a good Jew and the early church and to Jesus himself. Here is a phrase from an early church writer. It says, he who enjoys anything from creation, which is without, which is without blessing, commits misuse. It is a form of theft. At the last supper, Jesus lifted the bread and he blessed it. He lifted up the cup and he gave thanks. A simple lesson of praying out blessing and being thankful in your heart. This was not something unique at that time. <laughs> there are early Jewish prayers for virtually everything. And there's a, a funny and a, a true story, and please don't be offended. There was a rabbi who lived not many years after the time of Christ, and his disciples followed him around, and this is documented, um, because they followed him around because they wanted to be with him. And one day he needed to go to the bathroom, but he was still in the countryside. So his disciples followed him and because they wanted to know, was there a prayer of blessing for this? And there was. And it says, Blessed are you, O Lord, who has formed humanity in wisdom and who has created in him many orifices and many cavities. Absolute true that that's a prayer. Some of you may say, what a ridiculous prayer. Well, I would say until you have such problems in those areas. Then we are quick to say, God, help me, God, I just can't do this, I can't. 
in the most basic things of life, we can say thank you, learning that attitude of thankfulness. There was a great Scottish preacher called Alexander White, and he was known for his uplifting prayers from the pulpit. He always found something to be grateful for. One Sunday morning, the Scottish weather outside was incredibly gloomy, probably being Scotland, there was more than just one day. But on this day, it was particularly bad, and one church member reportedly turned and said to his friend that surely Alexander White would not be able to make anything of this today. I wonder what he's going to give thanks for this morning. And much to his and uh, his friend's surprise, Alexander White began his prayer by saying this, Thank you, God, that it is not always like this. There are times in our life when this is exactly what we have to say and pray. Thank you, Lord, that where I am today will pass and I hold on to you in faith. Finally, thankfulness knows our own weaknesses. Here is a challenge for me and maybe for you too. God does not ask us to only give thanks for the good people and the good things in our life, the easy to love, but the tough to love and the difficult circumstances. Thankfulness is a byproduct of learning to lean into God and allowing his love and life to flow into us and out to others. It flows from this, the realization that we need him for everything, that he has promised to be with us and he will never leave us. You see, if we only thank God in the good times or when we are experiencing blessing, the threshold of thankfulness in our life gets higher and higher and higher. When in reality we need, we want the threshold of thankfulness to get lower and lower and lower. So we thank God for everything that is around and this releases something in our lives that he does not have to impress us in order to get our thanks. We would all like that wonderful gift of hindsight that we could work, that we could work things out before they happen, but none of us do but we are still called to be thankful. How much will we let God carry us in the hour of our greatest weaknesses is determined by our ability to be thankful to him and be focused on him in the midst of times of weakness and strife. If in the midst of everything, we can lift our heads and see him, something change, changes. And if we can't, then he promises to lift up our heads if only we will ask. In 1636, amid the darkest of the 30 years war in Europe, <coughs> considered by many to be the most destructive war ever, but definitely in the history of Europe, and they've had many, there was a pastor in Germany called Martin Rinkard, who buried 5,000 of his parishioners in one year, an average around 14 a day. His people and his parish was utterly ravaged by war and disaster. In the heart of this darkness, where he ministered tirelessly, he sat down and wrote a grace for his children to remind them of good, God's goodness. And here is the English translation, which I think some of us will know. It says this, Now thank we all our God, with heart and hand and voices, whose wondrous things have done, in whom the world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. One way as we close to strengthen ourselves in the Lord is to be a people, to be a person of thankfulness, biblical thankfulness that does not deny the reality of life, but in the midst of that reality realizes that we have a God who is there and with us. Encourage us all to seek out opportunities to be thankful. This week, start at home, start at work to be thankful. Perhaps for some it's a habit and a posture of our heart that we learn, need to learn anew or afresh. But if we can, it is an exciting way to live. Thank you for being with us today. And as we do, please allow me the great privilege and thrill of praying the blessing over us from Numbers chapter 6. Please raise your hands. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Now may the love of God the Father, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the friendship and the intimacy of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and until he comes. Amen.